Did somebody disappear her because she knew too much? Well, as of today, still nobody really knows. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Sheila Bradford. Viewer discretion is advised. So with this case, it is actually connected to another case that I covered some time ago. If I can remember, I will try to link that video uh, to the at the end of this video in that little box up here, just so you can get more information about that case. So that case was the double homicide of a man named Danny Vine and his fiance Della Thornton. They had been murdered back in 1991. They were killed by the Bruce brothers who planned this murder because Danny Vine was a muscle shell collect or person who, who got them and sold them. And so essentially they were killed so that the killers, the Bruce brothers, could steal those muscle shells and sell them for themselves. They were caught and they were convicted of that. The brothers were Gary, Jerry, and Robert Bruce. They had a fourth brother named J.C. Bruce, who is more connected to this particular case that I'm talking about today. At the time of this case, Sheila Bradford is 33 years old, and she is divorced, and her and her ex-husband had three children together. Sheila herself was one of five siblings. She also had two sisters and two brothers, and she had been married to her husband, Jackie Bradford, for about 14 years. Sheila had at one point began a relationship with J.C. Bruce. J.C. had a lengthy rap sheet. He had been previously charged with uh, an attempted murder. He had been charged with rape. He had served time in prison. He had also been arrested for domestic abuse situations. And that is essentially what he became to Sheila. He became her domestic abuser. When this case occurred, when Sheila's case occurred, the double homicide of Danny and Della had already occurred. And from what it sounds like, Sheila Bradford had information with regards to that homicide before the Bruce brothers were actually caught. The police had been working on that case for like a year or so. So Sheila reaches out to the police, and this is in Camden, Tennessee. And she says, hey, I have information about this double homicide. Can we meet? And so they do. It was September 21st, 1992. They, Sheila had agreed to meet the police, or I guess specifically the TBI officers from that division. And they all agreed to meet at the Country and Western Steakhouse restaurant. So Sheila and her 15-year-old daughter, Christy, they go to the meeting. And at that meeting, Sheila says, hey, I have this information about this double homicide. But she also is there asking for the police's help for protection for her because she is terrified of J.C. Bruce. He has become physically abusive. You know, she's fearing for her life. And he may have involvement in this double homicide or at least helping the brothers cover it up or something. The TBI asks her, like, what information do you have? And whatever she tells them, they respond with, well, that's not enough information for us to offer you protection. And at that point, she's like very, like, okay. <laughs> but before anything else could happen, there is an explosion just outside the restaurant. A small building somewhere from, I guess, in the same parking lot had exploded during this meeting. And this caused Sheila and her daughter to get scared, obviously, and they leave because they don't know what this is all about. They don't know what's happening. A, could have been a bomb. Who knows? They would later determine that this building had blown up. It was blown up intentionally. Someone did it. It was an arson that led to the explosion. And now, at this point of time in 2024, they're now saying that that explosion was likely meant to scare Sheila and to get Sheila to not say what she knows. They weren't really saying that initially back then. But immediately, Sheila felt this like distrust of police, and she did not feel confident that they were going to be able to protect her. One, because they told her 
you don't have enough information about this double homicide for us to protect you, which is just wild to me. But now an explosion goes off. She doesn't know what that's about. Was this meant for her? You know, and so she kind of, she hides that night. I believe her kids were safe and sound with the ex or some family member at that point that night. The next day on September 22nd, Sheila decides to take a trip back to her home and because she wants to gather some clothes and she had some laundry she was doing. So she goes to her house and no one ever sees her again. That's it. She's gone. When she was initially reported missing, they people had gone to her home and saw that her drying was still there at the house from her laundry. And based on the laundry that was there, they actually believe that she was in her t-shirt and underwear at the time she just seemed to vanish off the face of the earth. All of her belongings were still in the house. The police then were not treating this as a legitimate foul play scenario. They, as a matter of fact, initially they said, we don't think foul play was involved here. Again, wild. She goes to police and says, hey, I have information about this double homicide. I'm also being abused by one of the potential people involved in that double homicide. I'm being physically abused. My life is in danger. I need your protection. They say, mm, sorry. Explosion happens right next to where they're having this meeting about getting protection. Then she goes to her house and then poof, she's gone. Just gone forever. Her car was found, I guess, with the keys in the ignition. And how, I don't know how they don't know. They, they, they didn't process from that moment that this was foul play. Like immediately that's foul play in my mind. From what I understand, there was no uh, signs of a struggle at the house. There was no forced entry, no broken windows, no cut screens, no doors kicked in. There wasn't... I don't even know if they truly processed the house, though, as a crime scene. It doesn't sound like they did because they wouldn't even let the family report her missing officially. They told police she's missing. Police said, eh, we don't think foul play was involved here. She's probably just hiding and she's on the run because she's scared because, gee, I wonder why that is. But if you can have that thought of, well, she's probably on the run, she's hiding from her abusive boyfriend, how do you not then also have the thought of, oh, maybe she was killed by her abusive boyfriend who whose brothers had committed a murder that she had evidence or proof of? It, it just doesn't, it's so, it does not make any sense. So I, I don't even know, I don't think they treated that house, her home, as a legitimate crime scene in terms of dusting for fingerprints, looking for shoe impressions or hair samples or anything. It doesn't sound like they really did. And so even if they were eventually going to say, okay, we do believe this was foul play and she was abducted, it's far too late to collect any evidence. Sheila's social security number has never been used. Her bank accounts have never been touched. Sheila has never been seen by anyone, not even false sightings of her or people who think they saw someone who looks like her. Nowhere. She's gone. Completely gone. Because the police would not accept this as a missing person from the get-go, there was no search for her, no official search. I know family and friends, they did their best to search for her and, and reached out to people to see if they had seen her. But the police, the TBI, nobody at that point did a full-fledged search for her. They didn't do grid searches. They weren't combing through the woods. They weren't looking in bodies of water. Nothing was done. Meanwhile, Robert, Jerry, and Gary Bruce were captured and charged with the double homicide of Danny Vine and Della Thornton, and they had been convicted and sentenced to life in prison without parole. At one point, I believe it was Gary Bruce, who actually escaped prison and was on the run for over a year, was recaptured, and then he was put back into his life sentence. Then he got an additional 10 years for the escape from prison. J.C. Bruce was never charged with connection to the double homicide. But in 1993, he had pled guilty to weapons-related charges, and he was sentenced to 46 months in prison, plus um, two years of probation. In the year 2000, he had been arrested again and convicted of an assault. And then in 2015, he was arrested again, this time for poaching paddlefish. It is widely believed now, and now at this point, it is being investigated. I mean, I'm sorry, but too little too late, but 
They are now considering this a homicide investigation in terms of Sheila Bradford. They now believe and they are now saying that foul play must have absolutely been involved. They did not handle that from the get-go properly, though. And so, so much evidence, so many witnesses, all are just gone. Like you, There's no chance of getting any of that because they waited so long to treat this, Sheila Bradford's case, as an actual case of anything. But it is widely believed that Sheila was abducted and likely murdered because she was going to tell police information about the double homicide. So she was killed to be silenced. Sheila Bradford, to them, to the brothers, knew too much. So she had to be taken care of, which didn't actually do anything because within a year, all the three brothers were arrested and charged and eventually sentenced to life in prison. If they made her disappear, they did it for nothing. In terms of which one of them did it, was it J.C. Bruce? Did he know about the double homicide? And maybe the brothers said, hey, you need to take care of her, maybe. Or maybe one of those three brothers took care of her so to speak. It's not really known. I mean, it is believed that they were absolutely involved, but they don't know anything for sure. As of 2020, the governor of Tennessee, Bill Lee, has offered a $10,000 reward for any information that can help lead to one, finding Sheila, and two, capturing her killer. Who knows, that killer may already be in prison for other murders. And I believe the public has then donated and they doubled the reward to, I think, about $20,000 or so. Somebody somewhere out there knows the truth. Somebody knows what happened to Sheila. More than likely, it was the Bruce brothers involved in that or someone connected to them and that double homicide. It may have been J.C. Bruce himself. And oftentimes people like, because they were, these Bruce brothers were they gloated and they were just known to be very cocky about these types of things and it's very very possible they they talked about what they did to sheila and so that means that there is a person out there who has that information and maybe they're afraid of the bruce brothers or afraid of whoever did this to sheila you can report your information to the police anonymously you don't have to say who you are all you have to say is what you know and that's it so if you have any information about the disappearance and potential murder of Sheila Bradford, you can contact the TBI at 1-800-TBI-FIND. One extra little piece of information to this, Christy, the girl, the daughter who, who had gone to that meeting at the restaurant with her mom, Sheila, she, she, she believed for years that police just really did not do enough or really much of anything to help get this case even going off the ground, let alone trying to solve it. But she herself now works for the police there in Tennessee. And she has vowed to change the way police approaches cases like this. And things have changed in terms of meetups with potential witnesses or informants with police or with the TBI. I believe they have drastically changed the process of that. Hopefully something good and positive comes out of this, but she still doesn't know what happened to her mom. Not really. And she deserves that. She deserves that knowledge. And this family deserves to take Sheila and bring her back home and lay her to rest if that's what happened to her. So please, if you know anything, please call and help Sheila Bradford and her family get the justice that she rightfully deserves. But that is it for this case, true crime, a Rooney Dooney Dingleberry Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, if you are new here, hello, my name is Mike. I tell true crime stories here on YouTube. So please subscribe, give the video a like. Uh, that pushes the video out to more people. If you like the video, that way the more people that see it, you never know, the right person might see it that can help get this family some answers. So uh, I also tell short form true crime stories over on TikTok, a couple pages. Uh, you can find those pages in the link tree in the description of this video below. Also, the links will pop up here in this corner at some point in the beginning and towards the end of the video. So follow those pages if you want to. Also in the link tree below, you will find my merch store. We have like t-shirts and hoodies and stuff like that. So feel free to check it out. We do ship all over the world. And then lastly, if there's a case you want me to cover, just send me a really quick email. Uh, send me the name of the case, where it happened, when it happened, I'll add it to the list. The list is over 6,300 names long. Um, I pick my cases at random, so I cannot promise you when I'll cover that case, but I will get to it eventually, I promise. But that is it for this video, True Crime or Rooney. So we shall see you for the next video sometime soon.
I don't know when. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe the day after. I don't know. I don't know why the voice. Anyway. Ta-ta for now, true crime. Maroonies. See? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-mm.